Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so we've made it uh, to the end of the term uh, and to the end of the class. Well, actually have quite made it to the end of the term. I think the term ends on, does the term end on Monday? I think it ends on Monday. So, uh, but we've made it to the end of this class, uh, which is great. Um, and hopefully, I'm really hopeful about this. We've soon will have made it to the end of online university. Uh, the weirdest experience I've ever had. Uh, and I'm sure it is for you as well. Um, so, you know, I've been at a profit Western for like 18 years or so. Um, and of course I've been a, a in a higher education for a long time as well. Uh, and was a, so it was like 30 some years since I was an undergrad. So I've been around universities and colleges my entire life, but uh, I can't ever remember a term that was this uh, brutal, uh, even though it's kind of nice to be home, obviously. I mean, there's benefits to that, but uh, from my perspective, and I, I, I'm sure that some of you probably share this, uh, it really has been a tough year. So I really appreciate you all sticking this out. Uh, you've been a it's been a terrific class, uh, to be honest. This is, uh, uh, I've really been happy with uh, the way things have gone. Uh, all things considered, I've been happy with uh, how well everyone has done in this class. Uh, and uh, I think we could all look, we'll all look back on this and hope that we never have to do it again. <laughs> um, that, that's my hope. Uh, so we, you know, all things go well, we'll be back uh, on campus in the fall and it'll seem a little bit more like a normal year. Uh, and hopefully I'll get to see some of you uh, in, in a third year class. So uh, let's get started. Um, uh, with today's lecture, I have a short lecture. Well, it's not that short, but it's like medium length. Uh, and uh, also have some announcements at the end to talk about preparing for the uh, exam, as you know, uh, which is coming up. But this is the final uh, content lecture. Uh, there was a question um, on Teams or email uh, just asking if I had meant to assign two chapters. Yes, I did mean to assign two chapters. Uh, that's, um, you know, there's just with, with limited time. Uh, and trying to sort of condense things into the, the full term, but not to overwhelm uh, with uh, online material. Uh, I ended up with two extra chapters that I still wanted to cover. Uh, the reason I'm assigning these two extra chapters is that today's lecture kind of covers material that's presented in both. Uh, so you'll see that I talk a little bit about language structure uh, in language and thought that's covered in chapter 12, uh, but I also cover some of the uh, syntax uh, and uh, language uh, comprehension, uh, which is covered in chapter 13. So I do want you to read both of them. Uh, I will have exam questions uh, that uh, cover the material from both of those chapters, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, at the end of today's lecture. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, share, and we'll get started. Um, okay, so let me move my little toolbar out of the way here. You think I would know how to do this by now, but uh, it's, it's nothing perfect. So go ahead and present this. You should have slides. I think there was one tiny correction I made uh, on something uh, between the ones that I uploaded uh, last night and the ones that you have, but you'll see that it really doesn't make a difference. Um, so let's go ahead and play the slideshow. There we go. Okay, so uh, final unit uh, on language. Not sure why we're doing this at the end. Uh, you could probably make an argument that language maybe fits a little bit better uh, earlier in the term, but uh, Anderson's textbook sort of covers this near the end. Uh, and part of the reason, I think, uh, is that it brings together a lot of the other things that we've talked about. So you know, remember way back <laughs> uh, in, you know, way back in the winter, we were talking about uh, attention and working memory, and we talked about uh, perceptual processes. And we talked a little bit about auditory perception, and I said that we would uh, sort of follow some of that up later when we talk about language. Uh, so he covered early on things like categorical perception. I'm going to finally get around to talking about that. Um, so it, it, it kind of brings together a lot of those topics. It's also one of the most sophisticated cognitive abilities that we have to bring together uh, sound, uh, vision, uh, different multimodal uh, inputs, uh, different ways to interact with uh, people. Uh, it's a way in which we communicate our thoughts and ideas to others. Uh, and so it kind of brings together a lot of this stuff. Um, we will not be covering the final chapter, though, uh, on individual differences uh, in categorization or in uh, cognition. I'll talk a little bit about what we're going to cover uh, at the end of today's lecture. But for today, uh, let's get started with talking about the uniqueness 
of language. And by this, I mean the uniqueness of human language. Uh, and lots of other animals, uh, species, uh, communicate with each other. Um, obviously, as you've noticed throughout the uh, term, <laughs> Uh, my cat tries to communicate with me. She only knows one word or two. I mean, it's uh, she only can make a few sounds, but she manages to get a point across pretty well. So she does communicate with me, and cats communicate with other cats. And uh, as the uh, spring progresses, you know, I can uh, got my window closed right now, but uh, to the left of me is a window. I'm overlooking uh, sort of the backyard, and there's some bird feeders back there. I can hear different bird sounds communicating. You know, birds communicating with other birds. There's lots of animal communication, but it doesn't seem to be the same as human language. And so that's one of the things we want to talk a little bit about. Uh, then we'll talk about the structure of speech and the structure of language. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about language and thinking. Uh, so I have a YouTube video here you can watch later if you'd like, but you probably all have seen this idea. So you probably all know about this. Uh, but if you don't, let's just talk a little bit about it. Uh, and this has to do with the way honeybees, uh, specifically honeybees, communicate with each other. Uh, now, if you haven't come across this idea, uh, it might sort of strike you as a little bit surprising that bees uh, are able to communicate with other bees. Bees do not have very large brains. Uh, it's a little bit of neural tissue uh, in their head. So it's, you know, they're not thinking in the way that we think. Uh, they don't have memory in the way that we have memory. Uh, they don't have concepts in the way that we have concepts. And so they're ability to communicate is severely limited, but they do have one thing, uh, and that is they care about uh, getting nectar uh, because they need to bring nectar back to their hive so that they can make honey, so that honey can be there for the next generation of bees, right? I mean, that's what the honey's for. So they, gotta, they, they need to go uh, get nectar. And in the summertime, uh, as I'm sure you know, there's lots of nectar from different flowering, uh, pollinating plants all over uh, your neighborhood. Right? Uh, so bees do a lot of this work, but they don't want to just venture out of the hive randomly looking for things. Uh, they kind of want to go where they think things are going to be. And so if you're a bee, I shouldn't, I'm using the word bee too many different ways, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, so if you're a bee and you're heading out looking for some nectar, you find some, you want to tell everybody else, hey, I found some nectar. There's a bunch of flowers over here. Uh, get, get over here uh, right now. So you take your, uh, you know, take a little bit of uh, nectar uh, back to your hive. Uh, and then they do this little dance, which if you watch the video, you can see the little dance. And essentially they just kind of walk around in a figure eight uh, on the surface of their hive. And as they do it, they kind of waggle a little bit. Uh, their abdomen uh, and the back end sort of waggles back and forth like this as they kind of walk. So they're doing this, they circle around, and then they do this. They only waggle on the straight part. Uh, and that's what you can see here. So here's a bee, it walks around like this, it waggles, and then it walks around like this, then it waggles, walks around like this, and does this little figure eight. This tells the other bees, fly in the direction of the sun, because I'm waggling in a way that's straight up and down uh, inside our hive. Um, it's walking up, it does the thing, and then it waggles. So it's telling them, uh, this waggle portion, uh, this is the direction that you need to go. Uh, if it reverses and it's walking down as it waggles, then it's telling them fly directly opposite uh, from the sun. So when you get out of the hive, you want the sun behind you, fly in the opposite direction uh, to find your nectar. Uh, if it does something like this, it goes on an angle, okay? So it's, it does the thing and then it does its little waggle, then it does the thing and it does its little waggle. It's saying, you know what? Keep the sun directly on your left and fly in the angle uh, that I'm showing you. Uh, so. I'm, I'm walking at a 60 degree angle uh, and I want you to fly at a 60 degree angle. Same thing if it does the opposite thing here. So now it's saying uh, it's a 120 degree angle. So uh, anywhere between zero and 180 degrees, uh, it can communicate this information, uh, which direction to fly to find uh, nectar. Uh, furthermore, and this uh, particular um, graphic doesn't show it, but it explains it down at the bottom. Uh, the number of times that they do this uh, indicates how far to go, so how long you need to keep flying. So they can communicate to their bee brethren uh, two critical pieces of information, which direction and how long do you need to fly. Uh, and furthermore, uh, they can 
retain that information long enough to get there. So the bees are doing a lot of stuff. One bee flies out, uh, it keeps track of the direction that it needs to go, brings that information back, communicates that information to the other bees. They take that information, they go out, they come back and they do the little dance, which of course will have changed a little bit because by the time they get out and back, the direction of the angle of the sun might have changed. Uh, so the bees that are watching it just follow that instruction. Um, that's pretty sophisticated. Uh, that's a lot of communication happening uh, amongst these bees. Uh, so they engage in this dance to tell other bees where a good source of nectar is and they're communicating with each other. Uh, but the question is, does this count as a language per se, or is this just transmitting one piece of information uh, to the rest of the bees? So what I wanna talk about for the next 10 minutes is why this form of communication differs from the kind of language that we use. Uh, I mean, one obvious way is that it's really simple, right? Uh, the bees are doing one thing, they're communicating one piece of information. Uh, but it's a really good contrast because it's a lot of sophisticated information, but it's not the same as the kind of human language that we use. And I want to highlight a couple of differences between bee communication and, um, and human communication. And we'll suggest that those differences are what defines language and differentiates it from non-human uh, communication. Now, we do some of this non-human communication as well, or non human animal communication as well. Uh, a lot of the uh, facial expressions that people make, for example, are rooted in these kind of pre-linguistic uh, forms of communication. Uh, we respond to sounds uh, in specific ways and we can communicate things to others uh, by doing uh, you know, facial expressions and body language uh, in a way that's different from the kind of spoken language that we're going to talk about. So we still have these same uh, non-linguistic uh, characteristics. And interestingly, I'm sure you've probably noticed this as well, um, hundreds and hundreds of languages, right? Thousands of languages uh, around the world uh, that are different from each other in terms of structure and syntax and sound. But body language is pretty universal, right? Uh, the kind of facial expressions that people make, uh, not 100% universal, but very much uh, universal. Body language, uh, seems to be universal, shared among not only uh, humans, but other kinds of non-human primates. Uh, so these pre-linguistic kinds of uh, communication systems we have, these seem to be very straightforward, universal across different uh, cultures, uh, different groups, uh, different languages. But the spoken language uh, can vary dramatically. Okay, so what are these differences? Uh, well, one is the B communication is not arbitrary. Uh, the bee's motion corresponds directly to the physical location of the nectar. I mean, it's exactly uh, the information. The angle that they do their dance is exactly the angle that you need to fly relative to the sun to find the source of the nectar. So there's nothing arbitrary about this. Uh, there's nothing fanciful about it. There's nothing elaborative about it. It's completely non-arbitrary. Uh, it's directly related to where they need to go. Secondly, they're not very productive. And by productive, I mean that they're kind of limited in what they can say, right? There's really only one thing you can communicate to the rest of your bee friends uh, with this dance, and that is there's nectar at uh, 90 degrees, right? That's it. Uh, there's really nothing else you can tell them about. You can't tell them about something that happened yesterday. Uh, you can't tell them about something that you're feeling bad about. Uh, you can't tell them about uh, how, you know, you're distressed that you look just like everybody else in the bee colony. Uh, you can't recite uh, the script to be movie uh, using this uh, communication system. Everything is pretty much limited to one thing, and that is go find the nectar. So they're non-arbitrary, it's directly related to the environment, and it's not productive. It can't produce new ideas or things. Human language seems to be fundamentally different uh, from animal communication in other systems. Um, let's look at some of the other ways. Uh, so we already talked about arbitrariness, but let's talk about semanticity. So the signal that we communicate with, uh, which for us is primarily spoken words, uh, written words are sometimes a proxy for spoken words, signed language uh, is another form of signal. Uh, so all of these are different signals, uh, primarily spoken, uh, but there's other variants of it. 
uh, it has meaning and layers of meaning. And we've talked already about this because we've talked about concepts and we've talked about uh, categories and we've talked about inferences and inductions. So uh, when you say a word, it has multiple layers of meanings, right? If I talk about uh, an apple, uh, it has lots of layers of meanings. And we can all appreciate that based on the context. So there's a semantic content to our signal that is kind of lacking from uh, a lot of non-human communication. Uh, and of course, there's an arbitrariness to it. Uh, the relationship between the signs and the signals that we use uh, and the meaning that we intend uh, is somewhat arbitrary. Nearly everything I say and everything that you say, uh, whether it's in English, uh, another native language that you speak, another second language that you speak, signed language, all the different kinds of languages that you can communicate in. Um, in many cases, the signal doesn't have a direct connection to what's in the environment. Oh, sure, I might be able to use my hands to gesture to the left and say, if I look out the window, right, that's directly connected. But a lot of the words that I'm saying aren't directly connected to what they mean. Uh, they're just signals that we have uh, you know, chosen to adapt. Uh, and have evolved uh, throughout our culture. Another thing that's really different, um, this is, there's a, a level of this in the B communication, but uh, it's, exacerb it's, it's quite extreme in human language and that's displacement in time and space. Human language can be used to communicate over time and over distance. I mean, this class, for example, is, a, is you know, something that would not uh, have even been possible uh, a little while ago, right? I know there are some, many of you are here in London, others are in sort of the GTA, but I also know there's students uh, in multiple time zones uh, who may be watching now, uh, but may be watching some other time, right? You can watch this lecture at a different time. So human language can be used to communicate over time and distance. We can talk about things that have happened. We can talk about things that will happen. We can talk about things that are happening and how they relate to things that happened. Um, other animals uh, have some degree of this, right? The bee communication we talked about uh, has a little bit of a past to it and a little bit of a future to it, though the bees aren't aware of this. Uh, they're, they're in no way is the bee aware that there's a past and a present and a future in their communication. But I mean, clearly the dance that they do is related to an experience that they had, like I just got some nectar. Uh, and they're making the dance so that they can tell the other bees in the future, like a few seconds from now, go over there to get the nectar. Uh, and it'll be exactly where I told you. Um, so there is a past, a present, and a future for our bees communicating, but they're not aware of it. Um, another one, so I've mentioned the example here, uh, vervet monkeys, uh, not velvet monkeys, vervet monkeys, it's a typo. Uh, they occur in the presence of a danger. Uh, so if there's an eagle overhead, uh, or if there's a um, a big cat uh, ready to attack, they can make it a vocal alarm system everybody hears it and they all go hide. So they know something is coming. Um, but it occurs, they only make this sound when they're in the presence of danger. Uh, they don't make the presence, uh, make the sound uh, to talk about, you know, yesterday when the eagle came uh, or the eagle might come tomorrow. So they don't make this sound to refer to uh, some danger. They only make the sound when the danger is in the present. Uh, so it's an evoked response. Uh, somebody senses, uh, a lion or somebody senses a bird of prey or a, uh, something like that, or hyenas, they can make the signal, monkeys can go hide, uh, but they can't talk about uh, uh, the stuff that happened in the past. Uh, they don't have the ability to sort of talk about it. Um, other aspects of human language, discreteness and productivity. Uh, it uses discrete units, and we're gonna talk a lot more about that in today's lecture. So we have sounds that are built into words, which are built into fra uh, phrases, which are built into sentences, which are built into whole ideas and mental models. Uh, but at the heart of our language are discrete units, uh, discrete units that can't be broken down any further. Those are those phonemes that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. Uh, the bees waggle dance is not like this at all. The bees waggle dance is one whole continuous thing. You could break it down into angle and length, uh, but it doesn't have the ability to be broken down into any uh, smaller units. Uh, and those units can't be combined in different ways. Whereas we can combine our set of sounds or phonemes or letters into you know, 
essentially an infinite number of combinations because we can make new words. Uh, we can take those words, combine them and make novel expressions. Uh, we can invent new things and then come up with words for them. Uh, bees and monkeys can't do this. Um, these elements of human language can be combined into an almost infinite number of phrase structures. Um, so all people speak or use a language. Uh, not everybody speaks. Uh, many people use uh, sign language. Uh, people can read, uh, people can uh, listen, communicate. So we can all communicate in some way, whether it's speaking or signing or writing. Um, no other species that I know of, uh, and that I don't think anybody knows of, spontaneously uses communication system, anything like a human language. Lots of hum non-human primates communicate with each other. Uh, and lots of uh, animals communicate with each other. But as we've already discussed, most of them uh, are communicating in a way that is directly related to what's in front of them. Dogs, lots of communication happening. Uh, they can think about the past and the future. They can communicate in sort of a rudimentary way about things. My cat can think about the past, present, and future. Well, not think, but uh, seems to show awareness of things that have happened in the past and things that might happen in the future and can communicate to me uh, in a simple way. But I'm doing a lot of the thinking, right? Uh, the cat makes some motions or some sounds and I interpret a lot uh, and that sort of helps the associations uh, to strengthen. But what doesn't seem to happen is that we don't, no other animal that I know of spontaneously uses its communication abilities to talk about nothing in particular, right? Uh, or to talk, to tell stories, or to talk about things that happened a long time ago, or to invent ideas. Uh, we can do that. Uh, we can use our language to, um, you know, to, to really uh, create a lot of new things. Uh, we can uh, use our language to help us through system two reasoning processes. We can use our language to solve problems. We can use our language to help us uh, make our way through decisions and to express our frustration with somebody uh, and to express our admiration for someone. Lots of exciting things we can do with language uh, that other non-human uh, um, species don't seem to be able to do. Um, so someone does mention uh, that research uh, with dolphins and whales can show creative language use. Absolutely. One of my um, my uh, graduate advisor, uh, David Smith, uh, University of Buffalo, uh, although most of his research is in concepts and categorization, uh, he also has a lot of interest in animal metacognition. Uh, so the idea that certain animals uh, can be aware of their own cognitive abilities. Uh, and some of that research has uh, looked into whether or, no, whether or not bottlenose dolphins can be aware. Uh, and bottlenose dolphins uh, have fairly elaborate communication. Uh, and it does seem that some other uh, uh, whale species who can communicate over really long stretches of time have a lot of these components. Um, they don't, as far as we know, they don't have the same kind of uh, reliance uh, on, on linguistic ability that we do. Uh, they don't sort of make it the center uh, of everything they do, at least as far as we've discovered. Uh, and it's, um, it's entirely possible uh, that we will discover some of these things. Um, primates, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, can be taught to use language uh, in, uh, in a human-like way. Uh, some primates have been taught sign language, uh, and other primates, especially at Yerkes Primate Institute, which is in, uh, connected with Emory University and Georgia State University in Georgia, um, their primates there, which are bonobo chimpanzees, uh, can use a, a sign board. So they press buttons uh, to make, uh, essentially to create words, uh, English words, uh, to communicate with their trainers. Uh, and they can do a pretty good job and they can spontaneously uh, use things, but it's not part of their uh, basic behavioral set. Um, whereas with humans, it seems to be something that our, everything is built around right? Uh, everything is built around being able uh, to communicate with language, whereas for other uh, non-human animals, primates, uh, cetaceans, dolphins, and whales, uh, lots of sophisticated communication abilities uh, that approach some aspects of human language, uh, but their culture or their existence, at least as far as we know, does not seem to be built around uh, the idea that they uh, 
the communicating by language uh, is one of the most important, and arguably for humans, the most important thing. Um, let's move on. We've talked about sort of the uniqueness of human language. Um, let's move on and talk a little bit more about some of the characteristics of our language, human language, uh, as we talk We'll talk a little bit about grammar and syntax, and then we're going to move into talking about speech production and perception. Uh, then we'll come back to this idea of how you use grammar and syntax to pull meaning out of the sounds. Uh, then we'll talk about language and thinking. Uh, so when I use the term grammar, and when Anderson uses the term grammar, and psycholinguistics use the term grammar, we mean a set of rules that prescribe the acceptable utterances of a language. Uh, there's a formal grammar. Uh, in English, for example, there's a formal structure that most of us don't know, actually. <laughs> uh, I've been speaking, obviously, like you have ever since. I don't remember when I learned how to speak, but most of us learned how to speak when we were toddlers. We don't remember our first words. Uh, most of us probably don't remember learning how to read, though maybe you have some dim uh, memories of early reading experience, but we learned how to communicate. Uh, with language before we were able to use that language to lay down uh, very strong episodic memory traces. Um, we've acquired a grammar structure without really being aware of it. Uh, so you might remember this is uh, a form of indirect or implicit uh, learning. Uh, we learn the, la the, the rules of our language without necessarily being taught. Now, of course, you might uh, learn uh, specific rules for uh, English grammar or uh, another language grammar. If you're learning a second language, uh, you might learn uh, about how the grammar is structured. Um, but you don't really need to learn it explicitly. Uh, you can pick it up implicitly. Uh, furthermore, we can use a lot more than what the official uh, sort of formal grammar structure suggests that we uh, need to. I speak, if you transcribe this, uh, you know, I showed you early on how to use the YouTube uh, transcription. So it's uh, down in the bottom half. Uh, if anybody doesn't know how to do that, you can go, I think that's back in one of the uh, MS teams, just search for uh, transcription. You can find the transcription for this lecture for everything I'm saying. Um, Zoom does it as well. I haven't uh, done uh, the Zoom transcription uh, services, but I see that it's on here. Uh, I can do uh, annotation. Uh, I believe you can do annotation on your end. Uh, there's lots of ways to sort of um, provide written annotation. And as I said, with YouTube, you can even download the entire transcript. You would find that it's not very grammatical. So when we speak, uh, we do things that are different uh, from... Is it coming in? No, you just have... I gotta close the door. See the kind of communication I have to deal with. One of these days, uh, we're going to get a little door so that you can come in uh, and go out uh, as you please. And I'm sure it's going to happen back and forth. Um, OK, so as you can see, Kitty communicated something to me. She came in and stared blankly at me, uh, which I interpreted as I would like to get up and sit on your lap while you're lecturing. I have no idea what she means. Who knows what she wants? She's a cat. Um, so this uh, set of grammar or a set of rules that prescribe what we can say, much more extensive than what you probably learned formally uh, in English grammar. And this consists of a syntax, uh, which is the way in which you sub, uh, put these sounds together. Uh, semantics, which is the way in which you map sounds onto meaning. And phonology, uh, which is the way in which you map sounds uh, onto uh, words uh, and units. So let's talk about these. Syntax are, uh, we're going to refer to this as word, order, and phrase structure. Uh, so the way in which you organize words uh, is going to be able to uh, dictate some of the meaning. Uh, not always, and it's not perfect, but uh, that's a large way in which we can uh, convey meaning to others. Um, semantics, that's uh, connected um, says, you have been signed out because your account is signed in from another device. Is everybody still there? All right, you're all still there, but you can see it's asking me to sign in. All right, well, if anything happens, what the, let's just cancel that. Um, 
That was kind of weird. You're all still there though, right? Okay. Um, if anything like this pops up again, uh, I will just message me on Teams and I guess I'll see it there and I can restart the meeting. That was kind of weird. Uh, I don't think I've ever had that happen before. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm not signed in on a different device. Um, same computer, I've been using all terms. So um, I feel like this is your fault, Kitty. Um, so where were we? Semantics, the meanings of sentences. You've got to be able to map uh, things onto different meanings. Um, and phonology uh, refers to the sound structure. Uh, so let's talk about how this is organized. And this is going to give us a good idea of how we can pull meaning out of sounds. And that's really what this is all about. Uh, how do I come up with an idea, a thought, uh, put this into sounds, make those sounds which travel through the air to the microphone, uh, then travel, I guess, through the internet and off this uh, unstable Zoom connection uh, over to you, which then enters into your ears via your headphones or uh, the speaker in front of you. And amazingly, uh, you can at least get something close to the idea that I had in mind. Uh, so let's talk about how that works. Uh, so we know what a sentence is. It's a sequence of words, right? Uh, there's a formal sentence structure, but most of the way in which we speak are phrases and phrases until there's a sentence, and then that's an idea. Uh, that idea is closed off, and then we start another idea. So we kind of have this uh, uh, ability to think in small ideas. Um, that sentence uh, is formed from uh, words, which are the smallest sort of free form that we have. I can use a single word and it can tell you something. Um, but we can break it down into two smaller units, the morpheme, which is the smallest unit of meaning, uh, and the phoneme, which is the smallest unit of spoken sound. Uh, morphemes have meanings. Phonemes don't necessarily have meanings by themselves until they're combined uh, with other things. Uh, so here's kind of how it works. It's a bit of a hierarchical structure. Uh, so the umpire talked to the players. Um, simple sentence. Uh, it's what happened at a ball game, right? Um, we can break this down into phrases. Uh, we break down the umpires talked to the players uh, into two phrases, two separate ideas. The umpires, that's one thought, that's one idea. Uh, you can create a mental model if you follow baseball or softball or anything like that. Um, talk to the players uh, and you can sort of get a picture or an image in your mind or uh, a set of ideas uh, or connect it to some, some other ideas that you might have. In case you're wondering, um, in addition to a window being to my left, there's also a window uh, sort of behind my monitor, which you cannot see. Um, Peppermint's now climbed up there, but there's sort of blinds. So there's a lot of rattling and it's not very big space for her to sit. Uh, and I think what's gonna happen is she's eventually gonna fall. Um, there'll be a loud crash uh, and a sound uh, coming soon. Um, anyway, it's a bit of a distraction, but I'm gonna try to ignore that. So the umpires talk to the players. We can break this down into words, right? The um, the umpires talk to the players. One big sentence made of two phrases. Each one is its own separate idea. Each one of those phrases made from separate words. Each one of those words made from a set of meaning-based morphemes. Oh, good, you made it down without falling. Good for you. Um, so the umpires is made of three morphemes. The is a meaning-based unit on its own. We can't break the down into smaller unit. So morphine is the smallest uh, unit you can get to. The is a morpheme by itself. It's also a whole word. Umpire, uh, in this case, is a morpheme by itself. You can't break it down anymore. You could think about the etymology of the word, but you can't break the word down into smaller units. Um, S, in this case, uh, is an extra piece of information because there's a difference between an umpire and umpires. And that S adds meaning. So it counts as its own morpheme. Uh, and you can see talked to the players. So sometimes a word, small word especially, uh, is its own morpheme. Stop pacing around up there. Um, these morphemes can be broken down uh, into smaller sound. And here we're just, uh, this uh, graphic uses a phonetic alphabet to show you sort of what the sound is, uh, the umpire. And each one of these are combinations of sounds uh, 
which we will call phonemes. So phonemes are language specific. This is the smallest unit of sound. Uh, these are made up of smaller units still, uh, but we don't have the ability to perceive those smaller units separately. Uh, we can perceive phonemes separately and they tell us something about what's being said. So when you're born, uh, you're capable of distinguishing a much larger set of phonemes than your language uses, right? Because different languages have different sets of phonemes, but uh, when a baby is born, they can perceive sort of a much larger range, but as they slowly uh, start to learn the language, they realize that some of these phonemes, some of these sounds don't really have any relevance in the language that they're surrounded by. And so their ability to make those discriminations uh, starts to disappear. Uh, so by about 12 months of age, which I don't know why I didn't just say a year, but 12 months of age, a baby will be primarily able to distinguish phonemes from the language that it's surrounded by. So whatever they're surrounded by, uh, whatever their native language is, whatever culture they're being raised in, and if they're being raised in a bilingual culture, uh, they'll be able to distinguish the phonemes for those languages. English, for example, uses about 44 phonemes. I say about because it differs uh, based on accent and region, uh, and it's not, a, it's not always a fixed number. Uh, so it uses about 44 uh, different sounds. You can follow that link to see what they are. Uh, phonemes, uh, is it best to start teaching a baby two different languages during the age, or would that be more confusing? Uh, there's a whole uh, set of, um, so just quick pause here is a question um, about whether or not babies should learn two different languages, uh, or would it be more confusing? I don't think there's any, uh, um, I learned two languages as a baby. Uh, I don't think there's any uh, downside to, to having babies learn two different languages. Uh, for a while, there was a so, sort of a suggestion in the psychological literature that uh, being surrounded by two languages and learning uh, you know, multilingual environment early on uh, would have uh, changes uh, in your um, sort of in your uh, cognitive processes, things like attention and selective attention and executive control. That literature doesn't seem to be uh, as clear as it once was. And so there's uh, some research has suggested that you can see an, sort of an advantage in general cognitive processing if you learn two languages. Uh, other researchers have suggested that that advantage for bilinguals in general cognitive processing doesn't seem to be there. But that said, it's, uh, you know, there's definitely no disadvantage uh, to learning multiple languages. In fact, you'd have no choice if you were surrounded uh, by parents who spoke more than one language, you would learn more than one language uh, early on, right? So if you had, uh, if you were surrounded by parents who spoke two languages in a country that spoke a third language, you would start to learn all three of those languages, uh, which would not be uncommon at all. Um, would being in a multi-language environment cause speech delay? Not really. Uh, it wouldn't really cause a speech delay. Um, so uh, kids can learn to speak the language that they're surrounded by. Uh, and um, I haven't done the sort of the research uh, in uh, uh, sort of anthropological uh, research in linguistics, my guess is that, uh, and this seems to be the case, and Anderson makes this case in the textbook as well, language development is pretty universal. So most uh, children learn to speak uh, at roughly the same developmental phase. Uh, they go through the same developmental stages, uh, which is, you know, they learn to name things, they learn to label things, they get two-word sentences, multi-word sentences at roughly the same age. So regardless of the environment that you're raised in, we do seem to learn uh, language in a fairly consistent way. Uh, if you've got two languages being spoken to you, uh, you would learn uh, to interchange those pretty well. Um, so I think the, the idea of sort of a, mo of a mono, large monolingual culture uh, is probably, you know, fairly common in North America, but much less common uh, in other parts of the world where uh, more languages intersect. But even in North America, there's lots of examples where people grow up speaking, uh, you know, more than one language. Uh, where I grew up, uh, which was in um, uh, southwestern Pennsylvania in the United States, uh, I think it was pretty fair to say that it was a, sort of a monolingual uh, environment. Uh, no one else no one else I knew spoke a different language. Uh, grandparents uh, might have spoken the language that they grew up with, 
Uh, so for example, uh, my grandparents would have spoken some uh, Slovak language, which is the sort of the culture that both of the both of my grand maternal and paternal grandparents were raised in. But it wasn't like they were speaking Slovak at home very often. They remembered Slovak from uh, when they were young, because their parents would have spoken uh, only Slovak when they, you know, emigrated to the United States. Uh, so a critical period for learning a second language uh, in this uh, toddler uh, age. Uh, so toddler and preschool ages. Uh, there seems to be a critical period where if you're not exposed to language, uh, you would be um, so show some impairments. Uh, that's always been a controversial idea. Well, it's not controversial that there's a critical period. It's been controversial how to actually show it uh, because uh, it's not really possible to test in, in sort of a, it's not really possible to test uh, in, a, in a very clear way, right? So children who were raised in any environment are gonna pick up the language they're surrounded with. Uh, and of course, we know that they will lose the ability to discriminate between certain phonemes and connections between sounds and ideas will start to form and strengthen in their native language. That can make it harder uh, to learn a second or third language as an adult. Um, but the idea that you would be unable to learn to use language at all if you weren't exposed to it is very difficult to test because there really aren't any examples uh, of people who would be, you know, go through a developmental trajectory without the ability to be exposed to languages. Um, so Cheyenne mentions uh, Jeannie. There's an example of a um, of a uh, of a young child who was raised in Northern California. It was Northern California, uh, essentially with no language uh, and never uh, developed the ability to communicate uh, very well. So her language abilities were uh, impaired. Uh, that's been a challenge to sort of interpret how much of that was just language, uh, sort of, uh, you know, a, a, an impaired language environment versus the additional stress of being uh, raised in sort of like a, you know, a horribly abusive uh, environment. So there are likely going to be some other things contributing to that. Um, but uh, the example that Cheyenne brings up of Jeannie is probably the best case uh, of this critical period that we know. Um, there's critical periods for other species, uh, birds, for example, critical period, absolutely, for their ability to pick up their uh, bird song. They can still pick it up, but if they don't hear it, uh, they won't be able to uh, learn it later on. So likely some of these things uh, contribute to this critical period. So we probably do have uh, a period with which we need to uh, be exposed to the language use in order to uh, uh, create those connections early on. Uh, we know that the brain uh, displays plasticity. We know that there is um, connectivity changes uh, in the sort of the first two or three years of life where we're born with a lot more <laughs> uh, in our brain, a lot more neurons that die off so that we can start to specialize these things. Uh, whether or not uh, that is, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to get that back uh, if you weren't exposed to language in the first 10 years. Uh, does still seem to be difficult to test, uh, despite the fact. Um, so someone else asks, I was asking, because it's harder to, yeah, absolutely, it's harder to learn a second language. Uh, and there's a, a, a number of the reasons which we're sort of just talking about now, which are, um, you know, you lose the ability to discriminate certain phonemes, uh, for example. Uh, and not surprisingly, you've uh, spent your entire first uh, 10 years of your life or 15 years or however long, uh, creating connections between sounds and words and ideas in your native language. Uh, and you need to be able to uh, switch that off as you learn a second language. Not switch it off, but uh, switch it. Uh, so you need to be able to switch to a second language. So most of us have experience learning second languages, and we know that it's, it's a second language, right? It's not as good as your native language. Uh, I studied German in high school uh, and university for years until I could speak it reasonably well, but just never quite got to it. Um, another person asks, is it easier to learn a third language if you speak a second fluently? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I have to admit, I don't really know if there's a third or a uh, fourth language uh, advantage for those who've learned a second language. My guess uh, is that it would likely be the case uh, for people who are really fluent in two languages or who have learned a second language, but maybe because they've picked up some heuristics that help them, uh, you know, learn second languages really quickly. Maybe they figure out how to do it. Uh, and once you figure out how to do that, uh, it's easier to do the second time uh, because you've learned a second language fluently 
now you know how to learn a third language fluently. And I do know people who speak three or four languages. Uh, my German is not very good at all. Uh, when we, I was in Germany a few years ago uh, visiting some collaborators uh, and it was, it took a little while, <laughs> uh, but you know, it does sort of come back after a while once you're surrounded by it and you sort of uh, pick up those things uh, that you had forgotten over 20 years. Um, okay, if you have other questions, uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, it's much more interesting than talking about phonology, uh, but here we are. Let's go back to phonology, but uh, continue to ask questions. And if I see them, uh, I try to keep this chat window open and I can come back and answer them. Um, so let's talk about the productions of um, screen sharing. Uh, screen sharing just came up and said you are production of screen sharing. Is that, why does my, is everybody still okay over there? Can you, are you still getting my video feed? Cause I'm having a couple of zoom issues here. Okay, good. Let me know if there's any problems. My toolbar keeps disappearing and the button, the little window came up. It says you are screen sharing, which I kind of knew. Um, and so it sort of distracted me for a second. Let's talk about the production of phonemes. Uh, here's a side, uh, sort of a side view of your uh, oral cavity and nasal cavity, and that's where air flows. And critically, I just want you to pay attention to a couple of things here. Um, so good, I'm glad that all is good. Anything changes, just let me know. Not sure why we're having a couple glitches here, or actually we're not really having glitches. Um, oh, so Malaka asks, is there a max number of languages? Don't know the answer to that. Uh, my guess is that uh, there probably isn't, uh, other than just sort of the practical uh, aspects of being able to keep them all straight or just have the time to learn them. Uh, but I don't know that there's any particular reason why there would be a maximum number. Um, so a couple of things to pay attention to. Uh, your vocal folds uh, in the larynx, that's what decides whether or not you're going to make a sound or just breathe. So you can do this yourself. You can Notice that when you're speaking, there's a vibration here. You can put your uh, hand over your uh, throat right about here. And if you sort of make a sound, uh, you can feel it vibrate. Or you can breathe, no vibration. So the vocal folds depend, determine whether or not you make a sound or no sound. Um, you can see that air travels through both the mouth and the nose uh, when it's coming out. Uh, your tongue can press against your teeth or the roof of your mouth to restrict the air. Um, and your lips can also close or open to restrict the air. That's all you need to have. You need to make sound or not. Uh, you need to stop the sound or not. And you need to stop the sound either by your tongue, your lips, your teeth, or some combination. And by combining all of those things uh, and also bringing into that the degree of air that travels through the nasal cavity versus the oral cavity, you can create lots of different sounds. I mean, you know how to do this, right? That's obviously you know how to do it because you know how to speak. Um, I'm gonna restrict this to English language phonology because that's what I know best, but uh, other languages use other kinds of sounds. Uh, lots of languages use uh, different nasal uh, sounds. So forcing relatively more air through uh, the nasal passages to change the tone of a sound. Uh, other languages have different stops. Uh, so not only stopping with your teeth, but also stopping uh, in sort of the glottal region. Let's restrict this to English, but the general ideas uh, are universal. So three things that matter uh, in English. Uh, voicing, whether the vocal folds vibrate, which is the case if you're making a z, d, b, or v sound. So try to make all of those sounds to yourself. Uh, hopefully you're on mute. Um, so if you make a Z sound, a D sound, a B sound, or a V sound, you'll notice that your vocal folds vibrate. You can hold your hand here. If you make an S, no vibration. Make a P, no vibration. So some sounds vibrate, some sounds don't. Uh, so that's one component of the phonemes. Another component is the manner of production. So we got voicing. How do we produce the sound? So whether the air is fully stopped, like a B sound. So if you make a B sound, notice when you make the B sound uh, and do this on your own. There's nobody watching. You're sitting at home probably. Um, notice your lips come together, B, and they make a B sound. Or the lips come together, P, and they make a P sound. So total stop. Whenever you're speaking, the air completely stops because you have to bring your lips together. 
or it's restricted. So if I make a s sound, you use your tongue against the roof of your mouth s to restrict the amount of air, but air still comes out. Or f if I make an F sound, uh, you use your lip goes underneath your teeth f like that to make an F sound. So changes the way the sound is stopped. It's either completely stopped or restricted. Uh, and then finally, the place of articulation. If it's gonna be restricted, where is the air restricted? Is it restricted by closing the lips, top of the teeth against the bottom lip, or tongue behind the upper teeth, like duh. So you feel your tongue going to the top of your teeth. So we can get a lot of sounds out of this. And as I said, other languages have other sounds. Um, and these make our phonemes. Uh, so all of these phonemes uh, can be made by voicing, manner of production, and place of articulation. From those phonemes, we can create morphemes. And as I suggested, that's the smallest unit of sound that has some kind of meaning. Phonemes by themselves don't necessarily have meaning. They convey meaning when they're combined with other phonemes. Uh, so the word car, for example, uh, is two phonemes. Car plus the phoneme S, which makes it plural. Unusual is two phonemes. Un, which is a prefix that tells you it's the opposite of, and usual, which is a word on its own. A runner uh, is two words. Strangers has three morphemes, strange, er, s. Um, and you can see that some of these we're gonna to refer to as content morphemes, car, usual, run, and strange. And others are function morphemes because they change the function. That plus s can be used with runner, stranger, and cars or car in order to change the meaning in a consistent way. So that's a function morpheme. Phonology and morphemes uh, allow for novel uses of language. So you can uh, add y or ish, for example, to any word and change its characteristics. So you can say something is dog-ish or cat-ish or fox-ish uh, or doggy or catty or foxy. Uh, each one of them adds a uh, meaning that's slightly different. Cat-ish would be different than catty right? Even though each one of them is adding a, a morpheme to create a change in what the meaning is. Uh, and we can, you know, we learn most of this uh, by about age three. So without formal instruction, most of us, uh, most people will learn uh, how to communicate using these combinations uh, of morphemes. Um, now, of course, there's more than just uh, phonemes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about speech perception. First half, so first we're talking about how to make the sounds. Let's talk a little bit about how you perceive the sounds. So I'm using all of that voicing, uh, stop or no stop, or place of articulation to create and put together all of these little sounds, uh, which then, as I said, you know, go through the air, into the microphone, uh, through the internet, back out into your speakers so you can hear what I said. Um, but there's a lot more there. So when you're perceiving the speech, there's a lot of other sound that's kind of irrelevant. Uh, one of the things you probably would notice um, if you've, uh, how many of you have recently uh, learned to speak, let's say maybe in the next last five years, a second language. Uh, if you learn to speak a second language or a third language uh, as an adult, as, which is what we were just talking about, um, you probably notice that you don't always, you, sometimes it sounds like a big long run on, right? You can't pull all the words out as easily as you can with your native language. Uh, how many of you have, uh, well, I guess we haven't been traveling very much, but imagine a time when we did travel, uh, travel to another country where the language that's primarily being spoken is one that you don't know. Um, it can be very difficult to hear where the words start and stop right? For a lot of us, if we hear a language that isn't one that we're familiar with uh, at all, uh, it's hard to tell exactly what it sounds like. And have you ever noticed that it's, it all sounds faster, right? It sounds like someone speaking a different language always seems to sound like they're speaking faster than you are, right? Uh, because you don't know where the end of the word is. Uh, you don't know where the beginning of the word is because you don't know what phonemes matter in that language. And that can really be a challenge at first. Until you're familiar with the phonemes and how they're used in that language, everyone sounds like they're talking fast and running all their words together. Well, as it turns out, um, we all do that. We all talk fast. Uh, we all run our words together. Uh, it's just that we don't notice it 
when we're speaking and communicating in our native language. Uh, and this is an idea called co-articulation. Uh, because I'm using just my tongue and lips uh, and larynx and mouth shape to make these sounds, um, when I'm finished making one sound, there's a transition point where the, uh, you know, the shape of my mouth changes from the last sound that I need to make and transitions to the new sound. So that means that each sound is dependent on the sound that came before. And if you're not a native speaker, that all blurs together and you don't know what words are being said. If you're a native speaker or even a very good second language or third language speaker and listener, uh, you know where those words end and begin. This is called a spectrogram. Spectrogram shows uh, the sounds being produced graphically by someone who is speaking. So this is a sentence uh, that's straightforward sentence. Uh, this is a pen. Uh, that's all I'm saying, right? Uh, and what you can see here uh, in this spectrogram, um, I don't know what I am. Now I've got some unstable problems here. If anything happens, I've got an internet is unstable uh, warning. So let me know in the text uh, if there are any difficult, I went slow-mo for a bit. Okay. Yeah, I must have an unstable connection here, uh, which is unusual. Um, if it happens again, just let me know. Um, is it is it good now? Are we still good? Okay, better now. Good. Yeah, this is rare. It hasn't happened on my end uh, for a little while. So um, I guess worst case scenario, if things uh, continue to degrade, uh, this lecture will be recorded anyway, and you can always watch uh, the rest later on. So uh, let's just try to make do. Um, it'd be just my luck. We would almost make it to the end of class, and then technical difficulties would bring it all down. So I'm still recording. Uh, it'll all be there, uh, even if uh, th this is missing. Uh, so what you can see uh, on this spectrogram uh, is dark areas and less dark areas. The dark areas are where the sound is concentrated. So when I say this, there's a lot of sound here, some sound here, and some noise up here, but nothing over here. This, and then there's a white space. That white space is the gap between the word. This is a, and there's a really nice end here, a nice big white sp space, because I have to get ready to make a P sound, which effectively cuts everything off. So this is a pen, I say. Uh, and you can see there's a big gap there. Uh, then a lot of sound right here, because I just went P to make a pen. Uh, and then there's some other uh, sound after that. One of the things you notice is these dark areas uh, seem like bands. So can you sort of see that? Especially it, it works well if you kind of sit back, uh, look at it, you can see there are dark bands that kind of go up and down, dark bands that kind of go down. Here's another one, baby boondoggle bunny. You can see each one of these uh, begins with a hard B. Uh, and each one of these Bs is slightly different. Uh, baby, uh, B sound in both cases, uh, not exactly the same B sound. Baby. B. You can see there's a lot of sound here, not so much sound here. Reason I'm su su showing this and talking about this is that there's a lot of information that we just don't use. There's a lot of sound up here. There's a lot of noise that's being made uh, that doesn't seem like it's very easy to pull a signal out of. Uh, and yet we seem to be able to do it. What we concentrate on, what your auditory system concentrates on is these dark bands because that's where most of the information seems to be. These dark bands uh, we call a formant. The formant is what seems to carry the most information uh, that can be mapped onto a phoneme and then a morpheme. Uh, and these things have a transition point uh, because each phoneme uh, changes the shape of the formant. And that's the invariant aspect of the auditory signal that we can use to pick up on uh, to be able to perceive things. Um, these things uh, have a transition point where they start uh, and then they maintain. So when I say ba, uh, you can see that the sound increases and then it holds stable. Uh, when I say da, there's a formant transition, some sound energy at this point, which seems to decrease and hold stable. Ga has a slightly different shape. These shapes on their own 
uh, when you see them don't have any meaning, but they do have meaning for your auditory system. Your auditory system uses the intensity and the shape of the sound to be able to tell the difference between the buh sound, the duh sound, and the guh sound. They're all pretty close, right? They all have the same vowel, uh, and one of them is buh with your lips together. The other one is duh with your tongue at their at your teeth, and the other one is guh, where you sort of make a, a stop a little bit further back. So the stop changes. Um, it's a full stop in each case. Uh, they're all voiced. They all have a vowel at the end of them. Uh, the only difference seems to be the shape of where the energy is coming from. Uh, so we have a very sophisticated auditory system that's able to uh, track this, map it onto what we think the phoneme is, which then is combined with the other phonemes to make those morphemes. It happens very quickly. Um, one of the things that we have to help us with uh, as uh, perceivers is this idea that we perceive speech sounds categorically. Uh, so by that, I mean there's a lot of different information around each phoneme. Uh, I can say it in different ways. I can say it uh, in ways that are affected by the uh, sound that becomes before and the sound that comes after. That's co-articulation. Um, I also change the way in which I say um, phonemes based on uh, and you know, there's accent differences. Different people say things in slightly different ways. There's voice differences. Uh, you know, when I say a sound, it's different from when you say a sound. But we mostly can get at the same. You know, we can mostly get the same meaning out of it. Uh, when I speak and someone else speaks the same sentences, we say it in a different way on the surface, but we're able to still pull the same meaning out of it. Um, that's because of these formant transitions. Uh, those don't vary. So the extra noise around the formant might vary, but the transition doesn't. Uh, and sometimes we can see this uh, with this categorical speech perception idea. So let's, let's take a look at two phonemes, the B sound, B sound, and a P sound. Only one difference between those two from the uh, perspective of uh, articulation. So try to make those sounds for yourself and see what the difference is you can tell that one of them is voiced, ba, so you say you can feel the voicing, whereas pa, you can go pa, the voicing doesn't come until after you make the P sound. Someone asks, can you explain what a formant is again? The formant is the part of uh, the sound energy uh, where the meaning information is uh, conveyed. So it's a, it's a portion. Let's go back here because someone else was asking. Um, in all of these, you can see that there is a dark, let's go back the whole way to here because this one shows them really well. Uh, you can see that there's a dark band here. Uh, there's a dark band here. And these dark bands seem to shift in the change in the way in which uh, the sound is, uh, uh, is being produced. So the Y axis here shows the intensity of the sound. Uh, uh, and the frequency of the sound in these different frequency bands. Uh, the, all of this sound is present uh, in the word pen. Uh, but you can see that there's a lot more energy uh, in some areas of the sound spectrum. These places where there's energy uh, is what our cognitive system, our auditory system, uh, is able to use that information to tell what sound is being uh, made. Uh, and these seem to transition in ways such that each phoneme has a unique signal. So that might be another way to explain it. It's kind of a unique sound signal, a unique acoustic signal that corresponds to each one of these uh, phonemes. Uh, and this formant transition is uh, sort of the intense uh, portion of the entire scope of sound. So these frequencies, uh, low frequency sound is lower, high frequency sound is higher. Uh, there's lots of different bands of information at each one of these frequencies. You can't perceive them separately, but your auditory system can perceive them to pull the meaning out. So you can't consciously hear the, fo the formant. Uh, you can't cause yourself to hear the formant transition, but your auditory system uh, knows what they are. So 
explain what a formant is. Uh, it's the uh, portion of the sound energy that carries the meaning that our acoustic or our auditory system has evolved to be able to use to pull the meaning out of the speech signal. Did that make it any clearer or did that make it less clear? Sometimes I explain stuff and I feel like I'm not making it any clearer because I'm just repeating what I said before. So did that help at all? Okay, good. Um, so back to uh, voice onset time, VOT refers, refers to voice onset time. So in your own home, try to make the sound B and P and notice that when you say B, your voicing comes on sooner right away because B is a voiced consonant. In English, the P sound is not voiced. So when you make P, it takes a little bit longer for the voice to start coming. Uh, otherwise, they're exactly the same. There's a voice, uh, set, you know, a vowel at the end. Uh, they're both made by restricting the sound completely with your lips. The only difference is the voice onset time. Suppose we had a speaker or uh, a computer make the sounds B to P. On one end, we've got a really clear B sound with a short voice onset time. The voicing comes right away. On the other end of this continuum, we have a case where there's no voicing at all. So it's just but in between, we slowly change uh, the different voice onset times so that we've got a ba with a slightly longer, slightly longer, uh, and we take a little bit longer to bring the voice on. So we can create a lot of different sounds from a really clear ba to a really clear pa and everything in between, which is somewhere along the line, it's gonna be kind of ambiguous, is someone making a pa sound or a ba sound. And you've probably made that mistake yourself, right? Occasionally, if you're speaking, you might uh, hear the wrong thing. So the way this works, uh, let's suppose we take a p, the, the bilabial stop there, um, which is a short voice onset time and a long voice onset time. And these are lots of different sounds in between. Let's suppose we create 20 different sounds. Uh, each one of them varying the amount of voice onset time. Uh, what we should see if, if, if the uh, signal was being perceived continuously, in other words, if each sound sounded different to you, uh, and we asked people to say, did you hear a P or a B sound? So we give them a forced choice. They hear a sound and they have to choose if it was a P or a B. Um, if people were perceiving them continuously, uh, there should be a continuous function where uh, the ones that are clearly um, short voice onset time are B sounds, and the ones that are clearly long voice onset time are P sounds. And as the voice onset time decreases, uh, you're less likely to call them P, you're more likely to call them B. Uh, and this should decrease sort of in a curve, right? Because as you increase that voice onset time, it slightly changes. Uh, and if you tested a lot of people this way, ask them to make a decision, that's what you might sound, might hear if you, you would observe if people were perceiving these as continuous variations. That's not at all what you actually see though. Uh, if you ask people to do this, so if you ask subjects to listen to these sounds which vary in the one critical dimension that differentiates a B from a P sound, they basically can't hear the difference. Um, Lots of voice onset time differences here uh, from the shortest, in other words, negative uh, voice onset time. So the voicing comes before the sound even happens. People call it a buh sound. Uh, and they continue to call it a buh sound until they reach a critical barrier, at which point they never label it a buh sound after that. Uh, so there's a really clear categorical boundary. And what psychologists have found also is that most people can't tell the difference between any of these songs sounds. Not only do they label them as being a B sound, they can't tell the difference between the different variations, despite the fact that, as you can see, there's a lot of difference in voice onset time between the shortest and the longest voice onset time B sound. Uh, so it's a really clear categorical boundary. What that means is that your cognitive system, your acoustic system can hear the difference uh, in the sense that it registers the difference at the sensory level. It's paying attention to those formants, but as soon as it starts to pull the meaning out and determine that it's perceived a buh sound, 
it does so categorically. Uh, it does not make a difference. It doesn't care about all of this variation because that variation is not meaningful cognitively. All you need to know, and as quickly as possible, because this sound acoustic uh, signal fade, fades really quickly, you need to know as quickly as possible that I hear a pa sound or a ba sound because the meaning could change. Uh, so we quickly, your cognitive system quickly strips away all of the irrelevant information, makes a decision about what it's heard categorically, and then can no longer hear the difference between any of these sounds. It's called categorical perception. And without it, we probably wouldn't be able to speak uh, or hear languages the way uh, as quickly as we can. Trying to learn a new language, however, you may not know the boundaries, uh, you may not know the phonemes, and so this categorical perception may not be operating properly if you haven't had the direct exposure early on. Okay, so that was the uh, sort of a detour into phonology and how to make sounds and perceive sounds. Let's talk now about how to get sound into actual language. We've been talking a lot about sounds, so I want to talk about syntax, understanding, and then sentence comprehension. We'll then move into some language and thinking. Um, looks like we're at about the 1042. So we're kind of at the one hour uh, and uh, 20 minute uh, range. It's not bad at all. Um, so I suspect we're probably gonna make it uh, to around 1110 or 1115 at the absolute latest. I'm trying the best I can to get all of this into uh, this lecture. If you need to go or you're uh, getting weary. I know these online lectures can get kind of weary. By all means, uh, it's fine to log off. The recording will be there. All right, syntax. Uh, a lot of different things, uh, got a lot of different things at our disposal to take these phonemes and morphemes and put them into sentences because that's where we get our meaning, right? I mean, morphemes have meaning connected to them, but it's not really enough to know what's happening. Um, so word order is one, uh, but as we'll see, it's not sufficient to explain production and comprehension. So the order of the words uh, is only one component. We need to have a little bit more, uh, uh, we need to have more information beyond just word order. Uh, and these are given or governed by this syntax or the rules for combining words into sentences. I wanna make a distinction uh, between a surface structure, well, which is words and word order sounds and the written letters, whatever is on the surface and the deep structure, uh, which is sort of the underlying meaning of the sentence. And the problem that syntax and the problem that our uh, cognitive system has to solve is how do we get this deep structure out of a bunch of surface structure? So how do you take the words, the word order, the sounds, and everything else, and abstract some kind of meaning in a consistent way. And this is a challenge because sometimes uh, you can see that there's more than one way to say the same thing, right? So perhaps you find this to be a boring class. I don't, but I mean, suppose this, suppose this is kind of a boring class. You could say this class is boring, this is a boring class. They're not entirely identical. You could imagine that they say slightly different things, um, but mostly it's the same deep structure, right? If somebody said to you, this class is boring, and the other person said, this is a boring class, you might not assume that they meant different things, right? You might assume that they kind of meant the same thing, even though they're saying it uh, with slightly different words. So we can choose different ways to say the same thing. In other words, a different surface structure can give rise to the same deep structure, and we can see the reverse. We can see the same surface structure ambiguously give rise to different deep structures. So visiting professors can be boring. Um, this can be taken at least two ways. Uh, one would be that if there was a visiting instructor, someone else teaching the class, they can be boring. Uh, the other way to interpret this sentence is that if you visit a professor during their office hours, for example, it can also be boring. Two entirely different meanings that would not be able to be conveyed uh, by the sentence alone. You would need to have surrounding context. So surface and deep structure differences imply that word order alone does not provide sufficient detail to extract the meaning. Uh, we have to use phrase structure in order to construct a mental model. So we use the word order to 
come up with an idea or a mental model of a phrase. We can then use the phrase structure to come up with a more complete picture of what's being said. Um, so each phrase, for example, uh, might have its own word order and meaning. Uh, and it can change depending on how you stop in the sentence or where you decide to put your pause. And we're gonna talk a little bit about pause structure, but also overall context, right? Um, even the previous example about this is a boring class, uh, depending on how you said that or who you said that to, you could be referring to this class, that is to say this particular lecture or the entire class, uh, you know, the people that are in the class are boring. That could, you could change that depending on how you said it and who you said it to. Um, Susan saw a man eating shark can be interpreted in two ways, depending on where you choose to put the pause. Susan saw a man eating shark, totally fine to understand that the man is eating a shark steak. I don't know why, but uh, let's suppose he is in a restaurant. As opposed to Susan saw a man eating shark would be uh, on the beach or maybe in an aquarium. Uh, you would shorten the gap between those two words in order to convey the meaning. So written doesn't really look any different, but said you can introduce non-linguistic information to help force the boundary of the phrase. Susan saw a man, one phrase, eating shark, another phrase. So that's one meaning versus Susan saw a, that's one phrase, man eating, a man eating shark is the other phrase. So depending on where you choose to create your uh, gap, you can change the number of words that are in the phrase, which completely changes the meaning of the sentence. Um, we also have regular. Syntax allows for new word forms. We have regular and irregular verbs uh, in English, for example. Uh, and those of you that have, um, you know, suppose those of you that have learned English as a second or a third language uh, later in life uh, might have, you know, might find this a little frustrating. I find it a little frustrating and I learned English, uh, you know, as my native language. Uh, little kids find this frustrating early on because they over-regularize. Uh, and this is not unique to English. This is just one example. Every language has some degree of uh, irregularity to it uh, because, and this, this is especially true in English, the number of words that have been borrowed from other languages. So in English, we have a common way to, uh, English speakers have a common way to make the past tense of something, uh, and that is to add ed, right? So wash uh, becomes washed. Uh, but other uh, verbs, uh, sink to sank is an irregular form. Right. I mean, there's lots of other words that are like it, but it's it's a minority. So it's considered to be an irregular verb as opposed to a regular verb. Uh, and we know how to combine these things. Um, there's a great study that was done where it asked people to choose which word. Uh, I think this is from Steven Pinker, uh, which word should fit here. Uh, and in Pinker's case, he created novel uses for these irregular verbs. And what he found was that people preferred the, uh, the regular form of the irregular form, uh, irregular verb. So when guests come, I hide the dirty dishes by putting them in boxes or in an empty sink, okay? That's a little bit lazy, but let's just assume that that's what you do. So guests are coming over, uh, which they used to do back in the days before coronavirus uh, and COVID. Uh, I hide the dirty dishes by putting them in boxes or in an empty sink. Uh, Bob and Margaret were early, so they're coming over, right? So I quickly boxed the dishes, totally makes sense, and I, and then subjects would choose, sinked or sank the glasses. And what he found is that most people preferred sinked. Uh, sinked is not the correct past tense for sink in English, but in this case it worked because it's an entirely new usage. It's not the boat sank, it's that I put them in the sink, so I sinked them. It's similar to boxed. So I boxed the dishes and sinked the glasses. It's a new form, it's a novel form, but we use our existing knowledge of syntax to take a word and use it in a new way. And what he found uh, is that when we take words and use them in a new way, we tend to use uh, these syntax rules as opposed to the irregular form rules that seem more unique uh, to the irregulars themselves. Um, pause structure and speech. 
I feel like I got a slide out of order. I think that synced and sank slide was supposed to come before uh, the man-eating shark example, because now I'm back to talking about pause structure and speech. Um, just let, let's just go with that. <laughs> uh, so I think I got one slide out of order. I just realized that that made no sense to have it there and then come back to this. Uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, let's go back to pause structure and speech. Uh, people tend to pause briefly after each meaningful unit. I do this, you do this, we all do this, and we refer to this as prosody. Uh, and it's the rhythm of our speech that lets people know where a meaningful boundary is, because a sentence can be too long, that it can exceed our working memory capacity, which we know is about seven words. But phrase structure, phrases tend to be shorter. Uh, and we can group them together based on pauses. And you may notice when I speak, let's pause there, uh, that I use pauses to indicate where the meaningful boundaries are. And that's exactly what we see in lots of examples. Here's another ambiguous sentence. And I can also clearly see that that synced and sank example either was totally out of place or I meant to delete it <laughs> from the lecture. It made no sense where it is. It was a complete, uh, completely out of place. So don't ignore it. Uh, just ignore the fact that I placed it in the wrong place. So they are cooking apples. Uh, what's the meaning here? There's two possible meanings, right? Uh, one meaning, if I say they are cooking apples with minimal pause, uh, we assume that there's some people over there, them, and what are they doing? They're cooking apples, right? Uh, straightforward. If, however, I change the rhythm a little bit and I say they are cooking apples, totally changes the meaning of the sentence because I'm referring not to them cooking apples. I'm referring to the apples being the type of apple that you cook. So they are cooking apples, it's one meaning. They are cooking apples, different meaning. Same surface structure written, different surface structure when I speak it because I have to change how I accent and pause these words. And this again gets to this idea of phrase structure. Um, we've got a whole sentence here, they are cooking apples. Uh, and if I want this whole thing to be a, uh, a, a verb phrase, they, I have to accent or demarcate in some way, either with a pause or by saying a little bit differently. They are cooking apples. So one half, them, it's one phrase, and the other half are cooking apples. That's the other meaning. If I change the way I say it, I say they are cooking apples, forces you to change the phrase a little bit. Still a verb phrase, uh, but now are is uh, working in a, in a different way. Uh, cooking apples becomes a unit now and a separate noun phrase. So we can convey a lot of this stuff um, a lot of this meaning by changing the way we pause, changing the way our voices accent different words to tell our listener uh, what the meaning is. Now, you, I'm sure you do this all the time too, and you never think about it, right? You never think about having to do this. If I were referring to some apples, I would say they are cooking apples. And I wouldn't have to think up front, explicitly and consciously, I have to accent the word cooking, right? It just happens automatically. Um, here's another example looking at phrase structure. Graf and Tori, uh, is an old uh, cognitive psychology uh, study, uh, sent, presented some sentences uh, to their participants one line at a time. And you have to, uh, you can press the button. Uh, so you get one line. During World War II, even fantastic schemes received consideration if they gave promise of shortening the conflict. It's meant to be kind of a confusing sentence, not meant to be uh, a clear, straightforward sentence. Um, but you can see that naturally, you can read it in a way that accentuates the boundaries. Form B, during World War II, even fantastic schemes received consideration if they gave promise of shortening the conflict. Gaps are placed in unusual ways. And what they found is that people understood the sentences better when they saw them in form one, form A, uh, that identified this so-called constituent structure. In other words, the printed form of the phrases accentuated the meaning-based phrases that were needed to pull the semantic content out of the sentence. 
another study by Atkinson and Scarborough asked subjects to read a sentence one word at a time by pressing a button on a computer screen. So if I asked you to do this here, you would see the word participants, press the button, get the word would, press the button, get the word press. So you get the idea. Each time you press the button, you get a new word. And they measured the amount of time that it took between button presses. And what they found is that people spent more time at the beginning of a phrase because of its lasting construction, as well as its power, the boat was of high quality. Uh, so that's exactly how you would say the sentence. You would accent that phrase structure by maybe saying it a little bit louder or uh, putting some emphasis on it. Because of its lasting construction, as well as its power, and you can see where the breaks are, people did this naturally when they were reading it one word at a time. They didn't have to. Uh, they interpreted this on their own. Uh, so longer time uh, between button presses where there was a phrase boundary. So this seems to be something that's uh, built into how we perceive and produce sentences. Okay, so we've come from what's special about human language to uh, what are the units of language? How do we perceive in speech? How do we create speech? How do we pull meaning out of speech? Let's talk finally about language and thought. And this will sort of be the last sort of main topic. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, things at the very end, but uh, I think we're on track uh, for uh, keeping things together time-wise. Okay, so uh, let's think about three proposals for how language and thinking go together. Uh, one is that your thought, the thinking that you, you know, whatever you think about, depends on language. In other words, uh, everything that you think requires an inner speech, right? So you gotta be able to think to yourself with language. That's one option. Uh, another option is that your language uh, depends on thought. In other words, without the ability to think, you wouldn't have the ability to create language. So in the first proposal, uh, thinking is internalized language. Second proposal, language is externalized thinking. Um, a third proposal is that they are sort of two independent systems. Uh, and each one of them can proceed without the other. How would we try to figure out uh, which one of these proposals uh, makes the most sense? Um, one is to look at the ways in which language directs your thinking or constrains your ability to think about things. Um, I mean, you, this is very clear how this works, right? You can use your language to convince people to do things. Uh, I'm sort of using language now to hopefully make you understand aspects of cognitive psychology. Uh, one of the reasons I sometimes repeat things is to try to get people to uh, think about it in a second way or to make sure that you've understood it. Or every so often I ask, uh, does that make sense? And then I look over in the chat window to see that you've communicated back to me. Or uh, is my video still coming through? Uh, is my video still coming through? We, we're all still good? Yes? Good, okay. Um, so you're all still there. Um, I'm just a little worried because I kept getting these error messages coming up. It's a little bit, uh, I could be speaking and lose the recording and then that would, uh, that would be kind of a drag. Um, so language directs thought. Uh, I asked somebody to say, am I still coming through? And some of you responded with yes. Uh, so I can direct thinking. I can direct my own thinking. You can direct other people's thinking. I mean, that's obvious. You use your language to reason with people and make you know, help them make decisions. Um, and so we use uh, language and thought as an analogy and as a metaphor. Um, there's another possibility uh, and that language sort of constrains cognition. Uh, we're gonna refer to this as linguistic determinism uh, or the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Uh, and that's how um, Anderson refers to it as well. Uh, and in this idea, uh, language and thinking are much more closely entwined. Uh, and in this idea, language changes your thinking. Uh, so it isn't the case uh, that thought depends on language. It's the case that uh, thought is constrained or uh, limited in its ability uh, by language. In other words, if you don't have words for something, you won't be able to think about it. Uh, and if you don't have a name for something, you won't be able to perceive it. Uh, if you don't have a name for a color, you won't be able to perceive that color. 
So we'll talk about that idea, and then we'll explore some evidence against it. And I believe that's the end of our lecture, I think. Um, so it's pretty clear that language influences how and what you think about. We've talked about this throughout the entire course. I mean, uh, we gave examples for how memory um, uh, interferes with uh, your ability to, uh, cre sorry, how language interferes with and interacts with your ability to remember stuff. So we talked about a false memory effect, the Dees Rodiger McDermott paradigm. Uh, we also talked about uh, how language use can make you remember broken glass when there was no broken glass. So memory affects, language affects your memory. Uh, we use language to make inferences and predictions and decisions. For example, um, not only are we using language to convince or make, you know, have other people decide things, uh, we do it ourselves when we see a sentence. Uh, the receiver, the reader, or the hearer must infer more than the spoken or written words. So if you read the sentence, Tom is no longer married, and then the next sentence that follows it is Julie is with another man, uh, what's the inference that you make? Most of us would infer that they were once married to each other. Uh, Tom is no longer married, and Julie, who was his uh, spouse, is now with someone else. It's not said. There's nothing in here uh, that makes that explicitly clear. There's only two sentences. They could be two entirely separate people. But what most of us do is we infer that there's a connection there. So in other words, we make a lot of predictions and inferences. We call these linguistic inferences based on what's being said or what's being read. The python caught the mouse. It has one meaning uh, for the word caught uh, versus John caught the mouse. Actually, it's kind of the same meaning, right? In each case, Python is catching it and John is catching it. They're both stopping it. Um, but the intention of what the Python wants to do with a mouse, the snake, uh, versus what John wants to do with the mouse probably differs, right? Python's looking, and let's assume it's a small Python that catches mice. Python's looking to uh, probably eat the mouse. John's probably not looking to eat the mouse. I don't know what he's looking to do with it, but he's probably not looking to eat it. Uh, so the intention is different. We make lots of inferences based on our knowledge of pythons and mice and of John. So we use our language to change thinking. And uh, language, depending on how it's presented to us, read or heard, uh, causes us to make all sorts of inferences uh, and deductions about what's being said. So if language affects our thinking in sort of higher order ways, like inferring properties or changing our memories, uh, how far can we take that idea? Uh, that idea was taken sort of to its extreme uh, in the middle of the 20th century by um, Benjamin Worf and Edward Sapir, who were two linguists and anthropologists uh, who worked on an idea known as linguistic determinism. The idea uh, of linguistic determinism is that language determines what you can think about and also what you can perceive. And their suggestion is that everything that you perceive is done so by your language, right? On the surface, it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, if you have a, if you're perceiving things categorically, uh, if you have concepts and you use those concepts to perceive and understand the world, uh, and we know how top down. Uh, cognition works. So you have ideas and they can uh, exert some influence on the things that you pay attention to versus the things that you don't pay attention to. Uh, we want to know how far does that get. So here's what Worf says. Uh, we won't read the whole quote, but uh, he says, we dissect nature along lines laid down by our native language. So he's very clear here that it's the native language. You can learn other languages, but the one that you first learn constrains the things that you can think about the categories and types that we isolate from the world do not find there because they stare every observer in the face. On the contrary, the world is presented in a kaleidoscope flux of impressions. I don't really know what that means, but uh, which has to be organized by our minds. Okay, I guess I do know what that means. Uh, he's saying the same thing we've been saying for uh, months now. Too much information out there to deal with simultaneously. We've got to organize our experiences into concepts and categories so that we know what's happening. And he says, uh, we cut nature up, organize it into concepts and describe significances as we do, largely because we're parties to an agreement to organize it in this way, an agreement that holds throughout our speech community and is codified by the patterns of our language. 
he used way too many words to say what he wanted to say, which is we use our language, our native language to cut the natural world into concepts. And what he says is that not all observers, so people who speak different languages might see the world differently because they speak different languages. And that's the slightly more controversial aspect of his claim. And that's, uh, Anderson discusses in his textbook, some ways in which we might test this idea. Now, of course, it is true that your language can help to determine the things that you think about. But what we wanna know is how far down does that go? And can we evaluate the final part of this claim, which is uh, all observers are not led to the same physical evidence to the same, by the same physical evidence to the same picture of the universe, unless their linguistic backgrounds are similar. If we can look at groups who speak languages that are very different in terms of what they name, um, Oh, just some clarification here. Uh, so uh, my TA is reminding me that linguistic determinism uh, is a misrepresentation of linguistic re relativity hypothesis. Uh, when I talk about this in my, and we'll actually come to this, which is great, uh, because uh, Maz mentions that linguistic determinism is based on Brown and Lennonberg's study, uh, which is what we're going to talk about in the next, uh, in the, uh, in the next slide here. Um, linguistic determinism, linguistic relativity have slightly different meanings. Uh, determinism is talking about how far and how much the language determines and constrains thinking. Uh, linguistic relativity suggests um, uh, perhaps uh, in this case a little bit more uh, realistically that you will find relative differences across different cultures uh, deter depending on what their native language, um, how their native language describes the world of phenomena. Uh, so this is actually a really good segue because um, the Brown and Lennonberg work, uh, which um, my TA was reminding me, uh, suggests that, uh, so there's two different pieces of information here. Uh, there are groups that have different language, uh, different terms for colors. Uh, so for example, um, in early work, uh, anthropological work uh, by Berlin and Kay, uh, they looked at the different kinds of uh, color naming uh, across lots of different cultures. And they found some universals. Uh, every language includes a term for dark and light. Um, every language includes a term for dark light. And then if they include a third term, it's usually red. Uh, and so there's a sort of a hierarchy of color terms. Um, some groups though, in this case, a group in Papua New Guinea uh, had two terms in their language uh, that they used primarily to refer to darker colors and lighter colors. Uh, Brown and Lennonberg suggested uh, correctly uh, that we are, it's easier for English speakers to process and remember what they called focal colors. In this case, focal colors being the center of a uh, color category that we have a term for in English. Uh, I've shown here, I'll show a couple of examples. I've shown here on the screen uh, sort of a trajectory from blue to red. Um, we can all see that this is blue and that this is red. Uh, this is kind of a pinkish color here, and this might be kind of a purplish color, but for many of these colors in the middle, maybe we don't have a good name for it. Um, they're kind of in between. So we all agree one is named blue. We all agree one is named red. That's the focus of the category, but we're not sure what these other colors are. And uh, what Brown and Lennonberg determined uh, is that we're better able to remember them. So for example, if I show you this color uh, and then ask you to pick it out from a grid, we might do all right. Uh, how many of you would be able to pick this out from a grid? So there's the color, uh, where is it on the screen? I assume, I wish I, well, I don't know if I enable the ability for you to write on my screen, but you'd probably find it somewhere around here, right? There it is. And I believe it's this one right here. So it's probably not very hard for us. Uh, we can certainly get the right column uh, and we could probably pick the right one out. And that's what Brown and Lennonberg found uh, is that subjects were better able to remember that focal color as opposed to something like this. Here's a color. Can you see this color? 
it's not as clear. I'm not even 100% sure which uh, column it's from. Uh, it could be from uh, the 10YR, the 5Y, the 10Y. It's somewhere in here maybe, but I think maybe it's somewhere around here, but I'm still not really sure. So what they found when they did experiments like this is that uh, English speakers were able to pick out colors that were near the center of their color category. So we can pick out good greens and good reds and good blues. Uh, we can't pick out the less good greens and the less good blues and the ones that we don't have names for. And that kind of suggests that we're going to be better at things we have good names for. We're not so good at things that don't seem to map onto the colors we have names for. So, um, Eleanor Roche uh, looked at whether or not these individuals in the Danny tribe who have two terms uh, are the same as English speakers. In other words, if they've only got two terms for colors, will they show an effect of focal colors for those two categories, which is they're only good at two things uh, and not so good at all the others? Or will they show a pattern that is similar to English speakers, which is to say they will show the advantage for the focal colors that English speakers have, even though they don't have the terms for them. And that's essentially what she found. Uh, they're better at remembering focal colors, the same focal colors, even though the individuals in the Danny tribe didn't have a specific term for them. So this was taken to be evidence against uh, the Sapira-Whorf hypothesis, which is that your language, uh, that their language would constrain their ability uh, to remember these colors. In fact, there seems to be this physiological nature uh, to color categories. Um, so although language influences thinking, it doesn't determine the types of concepts that you can think about, or at least it doesn't determine it as strongly as Sapira and Whorf originally suspected. Uh, additional work has been done uh, with naming objects. So here's Barbara Malt's research uh, asking English and Spanish speakers uh, to label these things. Uh, and what she uh, noticed, of course, is that people who speak English uh, might name some as jugs, others as containers, uh, others as jars. Uh, whereas in this particular grouping, uh, they would all be given the same label by Spanish speakers. Um, but uh, within and across languages, uh, subjects didn't differ very much when she asked subjects to put them into the groups that were most similar. So even though English speakers called them by three different terms and Spanish speakers used the same word for them, they still put the glass bottles together and the big jugs together. So English speakers and Spanish speakers didn't differ in their ability to group them by similarity. So clearly they're perceiving the same thing. Uh, unlike what Worf claimed, they are led to the same uh, representation of the physical universe, uh, even though their linguistic backgrounds uh, differ. Okay, so I think I've reached uh, the end of our content. Um, and I th think we've covered most of the important parts. So I wanna take a quick break here. Uh, and I want to talk briefly about uh, the, uh, the exam coming up and then we'll finish things off. If you've got questions uh, about things, uh, that I talked about today, by all means, put them up in the chat. Uh, but one thing before I get to advice for the exam, I am gonna be holding my office hours uh, every week until the final exam. Uh, so I'll hold them this week and next week, and I think the week after. So uh, my office hours are Thursday from one to two. The link is in the syllabus and it's on the uh, calendar uh, that you can find in Outlook. Uh, and if you, don't, uh, if you don't see it there, if you don't remember, uh, send me a message and I'll probably send a message around on uh, Teams as well. So if you've got questions on content, by all means, message me on Teams, send me an email or come to my office hours and I can certainly help. So let's talk about the exam. Um, we've had two exams so far uh, and most everybody's doing reasonably well. Uh, to be honest, the grades are actually quite good uh, given the format that we've had, which is uh, this distance format. Uh, so I'm happy to see that every, uh, not, uh, I, I don't know where you would have expected to be, what your expectations were, but uh, it does look like my average for this course is a little bit higher than it was last time I taught this course in person, but not dramatically so. It's certainly not lower. Uh, so we're in a good place. It looks like we were able to get uh, through the material, get through three good exams, um, 
I don't know exactly what the average is off the top of my head, Michaela, but uh, it's somewhere in the uh, lower 80s, I think. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what it is right now, but I'd have to look. I've looked at each exam and then compared it to the exams that I gave in the uh, uh, fall term 2018, which is the last time I taught the course, uh, and we're a little bit above where we should be. Um, I'm not going to make it harder to make it go down. So I'm happy to have everybody do well in this class. So uh, averages for a class like this, uh, for a second year course, uh, the averages are supposed to be or expected to be uh, in the mid low 70s. Uh, we seem to be a little bit higher than that, but that's great. Um, so let's look at the uh, what's going to be in the exam. We're April 27th. Um, is that right? Can anybody check to verify? I think that's right. Uh, so good, April 27th. Last thing I want to do is give you the wrong information. Same format as exams one and two. So it's going to be on grade scope. If you have uh, accommodations for extra time, that's already built in. So I've got the same list. It's the same grade scope account. Um, just like before, there'll be this 24-hour window where it's going to turn on at 12 a.m. Uh, on April 27th, and it will close at 11.59 and 59 seconds on April 27th. Uh, I know that some of you are in different time zones, so just plan accordingly, uh, but it's using Eastern Daylight Time for that. Uh, but the 24-hour window, I think, gives you a good uh, chance to take the exam uh, at a time that works for you. So 24-hour window, two-hour time limit, unless you have accommodations. So as you know, when you start the exam, uh, the uh, timer starts and you've got 20, you got two hours to finish it. Uh, exam two had about, I think, 80 multiple choice questions. Uh, so it'll be somewhere in the same range. I haven't completed the exam entirely, but it'll be roughly what we saw before, somewhere 80, maybe 85 questions, um, 90 if I absolutely have to, uh, but it'll be somewhere in that range. So it'll seem like exam two. Uh, it's going to cover units 9 through 12, uh, which is all this higher order cognition stuff. So the reasoning and the problem solving, the decision making, the language. Uh, and it's going to cover these chapters 8, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Uh, I didn't assign chapter 9. That one's not in there. Uh, and I didn't assign chapter 14. So I won't pick questions from that. Uh, I didn't cover everything that was in chapter 12 and 13 today. There's a lot of other information in there um, that you can read. Oh, it's 75 last one. Okay, so it'll be around 80. So 75 is what I had last time. It, it would not be more than 80 questions. Thanks for the reminder. Um, okay, so as before, open book and open note. Um, have your notes and the text open. If I were in your shoes, I'd be like control F for everything, right? Now, that said, you're not going to find every answer directly in the textbook. And you've probably noticed this on the first two exams, right? Uh, there's lots of knowledge questions where I ask, um, you know, to define something or ask for a, clean, a you know, quick definition or details. That you could probably easily control F in your textbook, find the term, find out what the uh, correct answer is. But there'll also be, as there were on the first two exams, uh, some application questions where you probably won't find exactly the right answer. But if you control F, you'll be able to find sort of where you need to be to answer those questions. Okay, so let's just leave it with some general purpose advice. Um, and that is, uh, I, you know, th this is something I usually try to end every class with. Uh, you can choose to do and be many different things, right? You can choose to be kind. Uh, and I think that's what everybody should choose. Um, you can't always be kind to everybody, right? Some people, as I'm sure you know, make it difficult. Is the discussion for this unit mandatory? Um, I'll come back to that. Um, but what I wanted to emphasize on this is choose kindness to yourself first, if you can, right? Because if you want to be kind to other people, you got to be kind to yourself first. So especially now when I think we've all reached, I would say sort of a, I don't know, would you call this a bit of a lockdown pandemic fatigue? We're not even really in a lockdown, but uh, as I'm sure you've probably all noticed, I don't want to get uh, too detailed uh, into uh sort of COVID misery, um, but we've made it through uh, an entire year of online university. You've done 10, nine classes, however many courses you're taking online, and it's not been easy. Uh, and I really appreciate the efforts that you've all made. Um, so you've gotten this content, but the frustrating thing, of course, is that 
uh, COVID and the kind of restrictions we've had have kind of just removed the fun part, right? Uh, so we've got all the work left. Uh, we've done all the work we're supposed to do. Uh, and we've done all of the uh, content that we're supposed to cover. And you've done this for your other classes, uh, but we haven't, we've kind of shut down a lot of the fun stuff. And this is true, I think, not just for this class, it's just true for university in general, right? So um, we've, we've done the hard work uh, and unfortunately we haven't been able to do the more fun uh, things uh, that are associated with university. I hope next year uh, is different. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm proud with what we've done, uh, but I know how frustrating it is to have had the fun parts uh, sort of taken away. So yes, choose to be kind, uh, but be kind to yourself, act kindly. Uh, act kindly to yourself first and then extend that kindness uh, to others. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop share and wrap things up really quick. Um, so a couple of questions came up, I noticed. Uh, somebody says, is the discussion for this unit mandatory? All the discussions are mandatory. Uh, as you know, uh, there's no, so I, I suggested on the uh, discussion forum that you would want to have this done uh, by the end of uh, next week, so Monday because that's the last day of classes. Uh, so that's when they're officially due. Um, but as you know, the discussions can be completed anytime between now and uh, the final exam. As long as you've got stuff in before the final exam day is over, uh, I'll give you credit for it. Um, most of you have your stuff in, but I know you got lots of other stuff to worry about. So if you need to take a little bit of a pause on the discussions, go ahead and fill them back in as you need to. Um, when I go through and evaluate the marks at the end of the exam, I'm gonna go back through everyone's discussion and make sure you've been given credit for that. So I'll take anything that's up through the final exam uh, and give you credit for it. You might not get credit right away because I might be working on other stuff, but I'll periodically go through and make sure you have the credit. So yes, there is a discussion for this unit. Um, oh no, actually maybe, am I wrong about that? It says, so, uh, uh, Alina asks, is the discussion for this unit mandatory? In the syllabus, it says there's 10 discussions for units two through 11, but this is the 11th one. Is that right? Are we on the 11th actual discussion? There was a point at which I might have started renumbering the discussions to actually match the class as opposed to the discussion number, which was lagging behind. All right, if you've done ton total so far, then I guess that's all you need, right? Uh, so maybe it isn't due uh, this week. I'll, I'll, so everybody's telling me that, that there's actually 10 discussions. That I do remember because they're each one and they're supposed to be 10%. So um, let me check on that. I'll just delete it if that's the case. Uh, for, or you know, I'll, I'll make sure everybody just has 10 in there. Uh, final question, uh, Malak, has, you've got your hand up. Do you have a, you had a question also? I just want to clarify the discussion forms on OWL. So we had discussion eight, problem solving, and then we had discussion 10, reasoning. So there is no discussion yeah. nine in between. So that's where the confusion came from. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that, Malak. That's where the confusion no, came no, from. Still 11, um, one, but it, the last number is 12. So, but it, they are not 12. Okay, so there are actually still 10? Uh, 11. So, the, so we uh, actually still are over one then. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, uh, I I have probably created several small layers of confusion. Uh, let me just check through everything else, and uh, I may end up just deleting this last one if that's uh, if we've already completed ten. The reason we went from eight to ten is that I realized I was getting uh, a number of comments from. I would occasionally get comments or questions saying like. Uh, it says we're on unit six, but the discussion is discussion five. Uh, and that was also causing me a bit of a headache. And the reason is that we didn't have a discussion for the first one. So by class two, we had discussion one and we were always one behind. Uh, and then I thought maybe I should just change it. Actually, that's giving myself too much credit for thinking ahead. I think I just screwed it up. And at some point it was class, it was unit 10 and I just wrote discussion 10 and then I just figured I would go with it. Um, so yes, we need 10 discussions. If this one discussion 12 is actually discussion 11, we're already still one over unless we started with, look, I don't wanna make this any more confusing than it has to be. I'll check to make sure we've got 10. I'll have a follow-up uh, message with everyone. Uh, Jordan, you've mentioned we've done 
10 total so far, that's exactly what we need because it's 10%. Uh, if you're doing more than that, you'll have 11%. And I've sort of built this around having 10%. Um, that said, let's go back to the original suggestion. If you've got to complete stuff, you've got lots of time to complete it. You can go back and complete any that you didn't finish. Okay, any other questions about anything before we uh, wrap things up? Okay, uh, I'm glad we made it. Uh, thanks for sticking with it. Uh, and I will uh, be in contact with all of you before the exam comes up. Uh, thanks again for taking part in the class. Uh, thanks for showing up every, um, every Friday, or what day is it? Every Tuesday morning. Uh, I really appreciated having uh, some of the feedback. It was nice to be able to do some of the uh, uh, interactive demos. As I mentioned in the uh, message, you know, obviously I'm disappointed we couldn't uh, get to see you all in person. Uh, I do hope that some of you get a chance to take uh, another course with me. Uh, my third year course, for example, I think is going to be offered in the, I think it's in the winter. Uh, so there's almost a hundred percent chance it will be in person. Uh, by the winter, and a pretty good chance we'll be in person in the fall. So uh, I'm hopeful I'll get the chance to see some of you, uh, meet some of you uh, in future courses. Take care, everyone. Enjoy this week, uh, and I'll uh, be in touch again soon with uh, updates, information, and good luck on all your exams. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone.